Hello, everybody. This is Jennifer Schaus, and we are coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us in our Webinar Wednesday series. These webinars are every Wednesday. They're complimentary. They are recorded, and you'll find the recording on our YouTube and on our website, usually within 24, sometimes 48 hours after the presentation. Uh, you'll also receive an email uh, from our team with a link to the YouTube recording. Uh, as well as the PowerPoint slides. In the interest of time, we do not take questions. So our speaker today is Sai Alba from Polario Maza. His contact information will be on the slides. You'll have his email as well as his phone number. And so if you have questions about him, you can contact Sai directly. We do wanna take a moment and thank our sponsor, NVSBC. It's the National Veterans Small Business Coalition. This is a great organization. They've got chapters all over the U.S. Uh, if you're a veteran or not, I think there's still a lot of great networking um, and training opportunities that they provide. So I highly encourage you guys to check them out at the nvsbc.org website. A uh, quick piece here about us. Uh, we do provide professional services for federal contractors, domestic and foreign companies, uh, product service and software firms, and we help them with anything from GSA schedules to uh, proposal writing, business development, marketing, and market analysis reports. You can find a full list of our services on our website under About Us, uh, and all of the services will be listed there. Our newsletter goes out every Monday at 11 a.m., and we reach now 21,000 plus subscribers. It's primarily government contractors. We do have some federal government folks uh, and service providers as well. If you wish to advertise, we're running a special for our December newsletter, and we can provide that pricing to you. Just send us an email to hello at jennifershouse.com. Uh, on Tuesday of next week, uh, so less than a week away, uh, after the Monday holiday, we're covering hot topics in government contracting. We've got five sessions here, uh, some of which should be uh, pretty relevant, including session three, where we're talking about Trump versus Biden and the policy impact of federal contractors. Uh, we've got topics there for 8A firms, uh, IT companies, as well as just uh, best practices on subcontracting. Uh, great list of speakers. You can register for this event by going to our website and selecting events and just scroll down to October uh, 13th and you'll find the registration link there. Okay, so today uh, we are fortunate to have Sai Alba from Polario Maza. They're a great law firm based in downtown DC. Uh, I've known and worked with them and recommended them for many years. Uh, and today, for the month of October, we are covering uh, set aside. So today, Sai is covering comparing and contrasting set aside advantages. And uh, I will stop talking and turn the floor over to you, Sai. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, th thank you, Jennifer. Uh, appreciate it. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Just so an overview of what we're going to talk about. I want to go through each of the different set aside programs and sort of the benefits and drawbacks is how I have this set up. Um, some of the drawbacks aren't terrible, but I just want to note them because there is a little bit of give and take on each one of these of these programs. Um, OK, next slide. And the, the first thing is just to recognize the goals that are out there and to say that everybody probably knows the government has this 23% goal. They keep talking about raising it, but it hasn't happened yet. And the goals are broken down, at least with 8A, woman-owned, service-abled vet, and hub zone, as indicated there. So there's a little bit of a difference. And if you do the math, the general small business goal that's not one of these is roughly 7%. So in theory, the government could go after just vanilla, I'll call them small businesses, 7% of, of the 23. Um, it's not exactly that scientific, but just so people are aware, that's just the general goal. And each agency can have their own. It could be zero, it could be 80. It, it just depends on, on each agency. So I guess, what are some of the benefits and the disadvantages? And we'll start with the vanilla small business program. So we want to go to the next slide. So what I'll just call the vanilla small business program is just the small business program. You have to be small under the appropriate NAICS code, and that's really it. 
Um, one of the main benefits I see is that there's really no rule regarding owners. You don't have to be socially disadvantaged or economically disadvantaged or anything else. So quite literally, someone like Jeff Bezos, because I've gotten this question a lot, Jeff Bezos could, could leave Amazon and completely leave it behind, you get rid of all the affiliation connections, start another company that does something completely different in government contracting, and that would be just fine. Even though he has you know, ridiculous amounts of wealth, that doesn't matter. That's irrelevant to the size of the business. The business, if it's brand new, would start with zero, zero re revenues. So because of that, you've got a situation where anyone can be an owner. You only have to be small based on the, the NAICS code. And it's, it's a pr procurement by procurement eligibility question. So your primary code, it doesn't matter. Um, it could be revenue-based or employee-based depending on what you're doing. And that every set-aside program requires you to be small. So you're really not having to do anything more than you would be if you're in a service that would vet or woman owned or 8A or anything like that. And so it's it's the most simplistic of the of the programs to, to deal with and just has a lot fewer problems. Um, next slide. Some of the other issues, right? It has the largest goal, like I talked about earlier. In in theory, the government could take 7% of its 23% goal and just go to vanilla small businesses if they wanted to. Um, the issue though is if you go with one of the other ones, you're automatically getting small business credit and if it's service able vet or woman owned or whatever. So you sort of double up, which is why most of the set asides you'll see out there have some sort of status attached to them. But it never expires. So as long as you're small, the program lasts forever. Um, you just have to worry about your revenues and, and whether you're exceeding them. You can joint venture with any other set aside program without destroying the JV status so long as, as you're small. So yeah, you know, the rules were changed. It used to be for hub zone, you could only JV with other hub zones, but that's changed. So now if you're small, you can join any team, be on any joint venture. And as long as you're small for that procurement, you're fine. You don't destroy the JV status, which is also a very sort of powerful tool. And then this next piece about having more business flexibility and corporate structure, that can be critical for your long-term planning. So with small businesses, there is no rule that says this, you have to have direct ownership to be a small business. So that what that means is the human being doesn't have to directly own the company. You can have a holding company. And that's different from some of the other programs that we'll talk about and it greatly limits your ability to operate, say, under 8A or under a service able vet or woman owned. It makes it harder to do long-term corporate planning. Whereas if you're just a small business, you can set up a hold co and have a bunch of different subsidiaries. Yes, they're all affiliated. Yes, you're gonna have to aggregate the revenues or employees in that case. But what it allows you to do is plan for different verticals, different business lines, and or even say one for your GSA contracts, one for something else. And then if later on you say, well, I'm growing too large and you want to sell a piece of you to get small again, you can hive off one of those subsidiaries and become a small business. You can't do that if you're in one business with just a bunch of different divisions inside a single legal entity, because I, I used to do that for people, but the rule changed in January to stop that. So now you can only hive off revenues from subsidiaries that are separate legal entities. It's also easier to exit. So if you're selling stock or selling assets, because you only have to be small to recertify, you don't have to be 8A or woman owned or service able vet, the pool of potential buyers is much larger and it, there's a lot fewer headaches that you have to, to deal with there. Um, so that's also a benefit of the small business program if you're thinking about long-term planning in, in that regard. Uh, okay, next slide. So some of the, the drawbacks here, I think are maybe obvious to folks is that there's no special benefits as far as any sort of sole sourcing or legal pre preferences are involved. And we'll get into the benefits in the other programs a little later, but you're just a small business is the bottom line, right? You're not 
8A or you're not anything else. And so because of that, there can be set-asides for you, but a lot of what you'll see out there, the set-aside pools are for some specific type of entity like hub zone or woman owned. And so you can't avail yourself of those unless you have the independent qualifications. Uh, because of that also, it's one of the, I guess you could say the least sought after for teaming because there's so many other set-asides being used. So the government, if they need to meet their small business goals and they have an 8A that can do it, well, then all of that counts towards the small business and the 8A goals that they might have. They can double count it. And I guess it's a good time to say too, if you're, let's say you're an 8A woman-owned service-abled vet hub zone company, the, if the government awards you a contract, they can tick the boxes for every single thing. So a million dollar contract to that company, which is very few and far between, but a million dollar contract to that company is the same thing as giving multiple contracts that is a million dollars for small business, a million dollars for hub zone, a million dollars for service able vet, one million dollars for hub zone or woman owned. So you're talking about five different contracts that you've just met by awarding to the one company. So that's why small business is probably the least sought after um, because there's just fewer contracts out there. Um, it also seems like there's fewer contracts. So yeah, there's the largest percentage goal, which is sort of extrapolating if you take the 23% and subtract everything else. The 7% looks like it's the largest, but because you can double count, um, there it seems like there's fewer contracts out there um, for people to use. But it's important to note that the small business program still has parity with the other programs. So you're not supposed to, if it's a new requirement, you're not supposed to say, well, 8A gets preference or HUBZone gets preference. It used to be that there was a, a failure in the drafting of the regulations and the law that gave HUBZone preference, but that's not the case any longer. Everything has parity. And so if the government doesn't need to hit its certain goaling for other programs, then they, they can just go to small, small companies. Um, and like I said before, because the 7% is addressed by awarding to almost any of the other types of small companies, then what you get is that it just relates for fewer small business contracts. Um, but I would say here, the main thing to realize is that corporate flexibility, if you're just a small business, your long-term corporate planning, which I know new companies aren't even thinking about probably, but it would be a good thing to think about how you're gonna structure your company so that if you wanna stay a small business, potentially forever, if you set up all these subsidiaries and sell them off as needed, you can continue moving forward and being a small business in perpetuity. And that's probably what I see as being the main benefit to this program. All right, next slide. So how about the 8A program? I know this is this is popular. If people qualify, it's seen as kind of the gold standard, I think, as small business programs, because it allows you to go after both 8A and small business work. And most importantly, there's a no questions asked sole source for if it's under 7 million for manufacturing or under 4 million for everything else. And so what happens there is if you're an 8A company and the government wants to get something done, they don't have to go out on the street. They don't have to do the rule of two analysis, which is when they go out and say, are there two or more small businesses capable of doing the work, which is what they have to do before they can go to full and open procurements. They don't have to analyze any of that. Um, they can just issue a sole source for 3.9 million or $4 million to an 8A company and that's it. Someone could in theory try to protest, but it's extremely difficult to win those. So you don't really see them very often. And you don't even really have to publish the sole source awards for like 30 days afterwards. So a lot of times people don't even know and there's no time to even protest. Um, a, a sort of a, another piece of that is the sole source awards for ANCs, NHOs and, and tribes. Indian tribes, it used to be that there was a $22.5 million cap on that. And the $22.5 million cap has since been replaced with a $100 million cap in the last uh, National Defense Authorization Act. And so what that essentially is allowing for ANCs, NHOs, and tribes 
is that they're able to get these sole source awards not for four million dollars but for a hundred million dollars um that seems like a massive advantage um it absolutely is and uh i i've seen it being used usually though i've seen it being used out of frustration where agencies are getting hit with protests after protests and they just go to just say forget it i'm just going to award this whole thing to a, a tribe or an anc and that's currently legal so i think people should also be aware of that um the issue though with these sole sources you have to be eligible the date you bid and the date of award so if you were to bid something and you put in your proposal for a sole source or your your, your outline of what you're going to do and the agency sits there and they're waiting and waiting if you graduate you're no longer eligible to get that award any longer so you have to be 8a at both periods for sole source that is not true for competitive though if you're 8a when you submit the proposal for a competitive rfp and then you graduate the next day you're fine to be awarded that contract and perform it through the end of, of the process you just can't get sole source uh, all right next slide please also, there's a little, this is somewhat tangential, but if you have disputes, the SBA is likely to get more involved and to help you, whereas for other programs, they're much more hands-off. And the reason for that is that technically for 8A awards, the SBA is the prime contractor and the small business, the 8A company is actually a subcontractor to SBA. And so because of that, SBA will get involved and help with performance issues another thing is that if an 8a is having problems and about to be terminated for default the rules allow sba to award or move that award from the 8a company that's failing if you will to another 8a company to allow them to perform and take over that contract without having to go back out on onto the street so that's another benefit but none of these things are magic bullets like i said you still need to have good arguments and a lot of times if the agency thinks you're wrong they'll just disregard sba and move forward anyway uh, next slide please so what about drawbacks well i think the main one is that you actually have to be certified you have to put in an application it's there's a process to it it can be difficult i know jennifer and her team are going to help with these things to help people get certified um, if you're if you're in a weird scenario and you don't exactly fit easily it can be challenging um, SBA also looks pretty deeply into people's pasts I've had situations where individuals had say DUIs or defaulted on SBA loans 17 18 years ago and SBA pulls that up and it's it's not really that that happened to you that's necessarily damning, but if you didn't disclose it, sort of like with security clearances, if you didn't disclose it, they assume you're lying about it. And if they find it, it's harder to explain it away. So that sort of certification process is much more difficult than something like the vanilla small business program, which is self-certification. And you just say, I am small. And only if you're protested, does anyone ever really look at you or dig into that further? also it's it's a nine-year program at best um early graduation though is becoming more and more common due to success and what i mean by that is in the past and i'm sure you know and heard of 8a companies who have grown substantially and had tens of millions of dollars in the bank at the end of their nine years the owner uh, and this was a very public uh, person a few years ago maybe 10 or 15 years ago actually who sold their 8A company and had tons of money with graduation and, and everything. That's becoming less and less possible because what we've been seeing is SBA early graduating companies. If the value of the business is clearly over $6 million because as part of the test to get in the program, you have to have a total assets, including the value of your primary residence and the value of your business of under six million because the rule just changed and it also has to continue to be under six million throughout the life of your 8a program participation so what that means is companies that are clearly worth more than six million that is an indication that you've exceeded that total asset test especially for the sole owner and they're early graduating 
I've had a number of companies that I've talked to in the past year and a half or so who had say 5 million in the bank. And as soon as you get to that range, just be as like, well, where do you live? You live in the DC area. Well, how much is your house worth then? And let me look at your primary residence. And it's not how much you owe on your house or how much equity you have in it. It's how much is the house worth on the market? So if you have five and a half million in the bank in your company and you live around here and your house is worth $700,000 or something, you, you're already over the six million just with that. They don't even have to look at, don't even have to ask you about your cars or your furniture or your jewelry or whatever, right? Or your you know, money you have in the bank. Just based on what the company is worth and what the cash on hand is and your house, you're over. And SBA has really started to push for early graduation there. So that's obviously a drawback because if you have a pipeline and you really focus on 8A work and that happens to you, you can't pursue that pipeline any longer. Also, there's less you can do with the company because you have to be 51% controlled and owned by socially and economically disadvantaged people and that has to be approved by SBA. So you can't set up the companies in the way that you would like. And some of the examples, uh, let's go to the next slide please. So some of the examples here are the restrictions in business structure, like I talked about before, because with 8A, it has to be direct ownership. So if somebody were to come in and they want control, let's say you sell 49% of yourself to private equity and they're really interested in your company. Great. But because of the rules, the private equity firm can't have control over things that they would like to have control over, like paying yourself an exorbitant salary. SBA says that's something you as an AD owner have to have control of. No one else can control it. So that's just an example of where that's going to make your ability to sell to a private equity or someone else much less likely. When you're talking about business structure, you as the human being have to directly own the 8A company. So if you own the 8A company and the 8A company owns a subsidiary, that subsidiary does not qualify as an 8A business. It might qualify as small, but it can't qualify as 8A. Further, if you decide to set up a holding company and your 8A company is the holding company, and then you have all these subsidiaries like I talked about before, that doesn't work because none of those subsidiaries are 8A. The exception is if you're a tribe, ANC, or NHO, you have a lot more flexibility to do that, but regular 8A businesses have none of that flexibility. So all of your work, all of your different business lines, have, if you're going after 8A work, have to be inside that 8A company. And because of that, you don't have the same flexibility to become small later, sell off subsidiaries and move work around. You can't do that. Um, the qualifying person has to be the highest executive and suitable experience. So in that case, you need to make sure that if you're transitioning into 8A, because I've seen people say, well, I'll sell my business to someone I know who would be qualified. It's not that simple. They have to make sure that they have the qualifications. Um, and then lastly, it's very difficult to transfer, the most difficult, in fact, to transfer contracts because before you transfer a contract, selling a contract or selling your business, you have to make sure that SBA approves the, the waiver. So if you sell your company, before you close on that deal, you have to submit a request to, the T for, to a waiver for the T4C clause to SBA. SBA then can sit on it and it takes forever for them to look at them. You can sell your that contract, let's say, without getting the waiver approval, but let's say in six months or eight months or nine months or a year, SBA comes back and denies the waiver. Well, agencies are required to terminate that contract for convenience once that waiver is not granted. So because of that, people are gun shy to buy, to buy companies or to buy contracts that are 8A. If they're buying your entire company, that would be a change of ownership. And if you're still in the 8A program, not you, the waiver isn't even half of it. You actually have to get pre-approval from SBA to change ownership. So in, in that context, it's an additional hurdle. And they're never going to grant the waiver or give approval to change ownership most of the time unless you're, the buyer is an 8A company that's already certified. So that greatly diminishes your potential pool of of buyers when you're talking about an 8A business. All right, next slide. 
So when you talk about hub zone companies, the benefits there is obviously your hub zone and small business, like, like we talked about. There are more limitations than when you're a small business, but it's still limited. It, you just need to be a US citizen um, as opposed to anybody. Um, and that's the same, actually with small businesses, you still have to be, you can be owned by foreign individuals so long as you're based in the US or you're contributing to the US. Whereas hub zone, the owners actually that have 51% actually have to be US citizens. Not a huge hurdle though for most people here at least. Um, Another big benefit is that if you go after full and open procurements, not small business procurements, not, a, not whatever, if you have other certifications, it has to be full and open, unrestricted procurements, you get a 10% evaluation preference. So that essentially means what they do is they look at everyone's prices when you bid, and if you're anyone who's not HubZone, they increase their price 10% for purposes of the evaluation and to see if, you're, if you as the HubZone are lower in price. And that obviously gives you somewhat of a leg up, not massive, but it gives you a leg up when going after full and open work. This is also good because if you're a hub zone, you're thinking about, I'm almost gonna be large business, I'm trying to transition. Going after that full and open work and getting that little notch in your belt to show people, look, I can compete with the big boys that are in this full and open procurement, even though you're getting this price preference, it also makes it easier for people if they wanna come in and buy your business or look into investing in you, it's a benefit. Also here, just like with small business, you can have indirect ownership. So you can have a hub zone company that's under a holding company. And so if you want one of your businesses to be hub zone, you have your ownership in a holding company. One subsidiary is hub zone, the other subsidiaries are not, that's fine. And you can try to segregate the types of work and make it so that try to de-affiliate for hub zone purposes, not for size purposes, but de-affiliate for hub zone purposes, that subsidiary versus other subsidiaries. And the reason that's important is, um, let's go to the next slide, please. The, these various rules, I guess it's a, cu a couple of slides later, we'll, we'll talk about the, the various rules, like the 35% and whatnot. Um, but if you de-affiliate, you don't have to worry about them those other hub zone specific rules. Some of the other benefits is that sole source is allowed so long as if the government says, I wanna to award to a hub zone, and this is true for woman owned and, and uh, service able vet as well. I wanna to award to a hub zone. They go out and they look and they say, oh, there aren't two or more hub zones that are able to do this. Once they've made that determination, they can sole source to one hub zone company. And currently it's 4 million and six and a half million. I think those numbers are supposed to change pretty soon and go up, um, but that's the, the current rule. Like I said, you have greater business flexibility. It doesn't have to be direct ownership. And then this, the affiliation issue I alluded to before, you might be affiliated for size purposes. So whether or not you're a small business and aggregating revenues, but you can still be de-affiliated for hub zone purposes. And that's, let's go to the next slide. So for hub zone purposes, what I mean by that is this whole idea of 35% or 20% of your employees have to reside in a hub zone and your principal office has to be in a hub zone. To make that determination, the principal office determination is where the majority of your employees at any one location do their work. The 35% is all of your employees. So if you have, if you're a hub zone business and all of your divisions and work are in one company, when you do that principal office and 35% and 25% analysis, it's every employee you have. Whereas if you have a holding company and you drop one of your subsidiaries down to be a hub zone firm, which you can do now under the rules, you might, if it's structured the right way, only have to worry about that subsidiary when you're looking at the principal office and you're looking at this 35% versus 25, 20% rule. And this 20% is also new, so that it used to be you had to have 35% of your employees reside in the hub zone to be eligible. Well, now that's your initial eligibility. And then going forward, you only have to have 20% and certify to that every year and say, well, once you start performing a hub zone contract, and you have a hub zone contract, you can continue to be hub zone eligible so long as you maintain that, that 
but your initial certification and then your major recertification every three years, you have to be at the 35%. And then that first contract you bid on, you have to be at the 35%. But after that, it drops down to this 20% for the next, like the two years in, in between the major recertifications. The employees you're talking about to meet that 35% and 20%, they only have to work 40 hours a month, not a week. So it's, and it's average over the, the prior four weeks before your certification. So that lets you get students, it lets you get part-time people to come in and SBA has reaffirmed that that's what they're keeping. So that gives you flexibility there as well. Um, you're also allowed, SBA said, to use the, what I call these hub zone employee aggregators, these companies that they employ a bunch of people who work in a hub zone and then they sort of lease them out or let you use them to find. And then that company says, okay, you can have them for 10 hours a week. You, you company number two can have them for 10 hours. You company number three, 10 hours. You company number four, 10 hours. So it takes that one hub zone employee and spreads it across four companies to essentially become four employees. SBA said that's fine in the new rule. So that, that's allowed. Um, note also though that the affiliate issues, it's, it's not a simple analysis as to whether if you have affiliates, they're de-affiliated for HubZone purposes or not. That's an open question that has to be analyzed. So just realize that it's not automatic that if it's a different company, it's not affiliated. It's a little tricky. Okay, next slide, please. Some of the drawbacks, um, the employees, it, you have to look at the type of work they're doing and where they're doing the work. Um, if you have this secondary business, like I said, with these different affiliates, it, you can get around it, but it's still something you need to pay attention to. So can you get employees? And one example I had is a company who was looking for PhD prepared folks and they couldn't find any hub zone residents who had that qualification, that might just mean you can't do that kind of work as a hub zone. Even if there's hub zone set-asides out there, if you can't find it and meet those percentages, the, the 35 or the 20, you might not be able to do that work and that's your responsibility. So just remember that. Uh, next slide, please. So going on to the service disabled veteran work, Again, just like these other programs, you can do regular small business and service able vet work, which is obviously good. For the SBA's program, and there are still two programs, the SBA and the VA, for the SBA's program, it's self-certified. You don't have to get certification from SBA. You just say, I am a service able vet, and you're good to go. Note, there is no veteran-owned small business, uh, small business set, set aside program under SBA. That is only with the VA. So the VA has service disabled and veteran owned as kind of two separate programs. That is only at the VA. The CVE certification, you only need for VA work. You don't need that for non-VA work. It is purely self-certification. So that's a benefit. If you're not going after VA work, you don't have to worry about going through that process. Again, just like HubZone, if they decide to award to a service disabled vet, they only need to look and say, oh, we think there's two, so we're gonna set it aside. But then if they only get one bid or only one of them is acceptable, they can then sole source that to the SDVOSB with these limitations. So you do still have that sole source benefit. It's just not as great as with 8A. Uh, next slide, please. As far as some drawbacks, there are ownership restrictions similar to 8A. So the owner has to be, if it's a service disabled vet program, it has to be a service disabled veteran. But note that the service connected disability can be a 0% disability. So as long as you have a letter from the VA giving you some disability rating, even if it's 0%, you can still qualify as a service disabled veteran um, and do the work. However, this has been really something that ha they've looked at carefully. So you got to make sure that the service able vet owner really is has the qualifications, is managing the work, is doing everything. And they also have to have control in the corporate documents over major actions. Uh, next slide, please. So a good way to look at this is 
it also has the strictest control rules. So that control I was talking about over major actions, it's anything other than these five things. So no other program is this explicit as to what other people can have control over. So if you have a 49% owner, they can sort of veto the veteran on adding new members, dissolving the company, selling the company, merging the company, or declaring bankruptcy. That's it. If you want to say, well, the 49% owner should really have a right in whether or not the veteran just decides, I'm going to pay myself every ounce of profit out of the company and give you 49% owner nothing. I, I, as the 49% owner, should have control of that, right? Wrong. Not in this program. The veteran has to have control, the service disabled veteran has to have control over all of that and unanimous con control only by themselves. It cannot be unanimous consent of all members. And that's, that's you got to have trust, obviously, but that's one of the big hangups with whether it's private equity or other people coming in to buy into service able vet companies because it is so limited. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing here is I, I say if you're just a veteran, remember there's no program for you if you're not service disabled except for at the VA. And even at the VA, it's service disabled first, and only if they can't find anyone does it drop down into veteran-owned companies. And it's, so that's only in the VA and only if there are no service disabled veterans who can do the work. So the veteran program is very limited. Um, and I don't think people realize that all the time. The other issue is I think from just my experience and anecdotally speaking, this program has the highest fraud visibility out of any other program. This is the program where the DOJ and other people love to find what they would call like rent -a vets and really prosecute people. And so you have to be very careful if you're working with service able vet companies or if you're looking to start one or become one or buy into one or something like that, that the service abled veteran or veteran is really controlling everything that they're supposed to be and have are meeting all the qualifications otherwise more so than any other program this is going to get get looked at uh, next slide please all right so moving on to the, the last program is the woman-owned program and there again just like the other ones you are a small business you have to be a small business so you can go after vanilla small business and woman-owned small business work the EDWOSB program, we'll get into in a minute, is different from WSB. So it's sort of like with the service disabled vet, you had service disabled vet and veteran at the VA. Here you have woman owned and economically disadvantaged woman owned. Sole sources, again, are allowed for each of these two programs, but only if the rule of two was met in the solicitation. So if the government went out there and thought, there's definitely two woman-owned or economically disadvantaged woman-owned small businesses who could do this work. And then they realize through the procurement process that there's only one. That's the scenario, just like with the ones I stated before, where you can do a sole source. What you can't do in the woman-owned, service-abled vet or hub zone programs or vanilla small business is you can't say, well, I just want to sole source to them without any questions asked. The only time you can go through that, well, I just want a sole source, so I'm gonna do it, is with the 8A program. None of the other programs have that capability. I will say there has been a push to do that for the woman-owned program, but it hasn't gotten through Congress any time that it's been proposed. And again, there's this limitation of four million for services or six and a half for manufacturing, but we think that's going to change soon, uh, or they keep trying to raise it. Next slide, please. So the other thing here for woman-owned programs is you actually now have to be certified. So as of, or I should say in next week, I guess, <laughs> as of October 15, 2020, you're going to have to be certified independently by SBA or through a third-party certifier. And so when you look at that, it's going to be a little bit more of an owner's process than it used to be um, today, for instance. If you bid on a woman-owned procurement right now, you could self-certify. But next week, you're not going to be able to do that any longer. So the woman-owned program is going to get a little bit more strict. And so that 
like 8A or like HUBZone, where you have to be certified, or if you're going after VA work, the service able vet or veteran program, where you also have to be certified through the, the VA zone program, it's a little bit more onerous, and you're gonna have to put that in place and go through that process. Also, it should be noted that this program, unlike any other program, is limited to only certain NAICS codes. And this is the, the link, you can click on it, you can see which ones. The EDWSB codes are broader and the woman-owned codes are more narrow. And the idea there is that SBA said, well, we're gonna have this woman-owned program, but because they put, I guess, women, the idea is women are in a different classification than um, like policy-wise, I guess, then socially and economically disadvantaged individuals or veterans or um, hub zone um, participants, that we think that this program should only apply in industries where women are underrepresented or significantly underrepresented in the case of standard WSB. So that's where they've gone through, SBA has gone through and made a determination that only these NAICS codes apply and so women-owned set-asides or EDWSB set-asides don't occur broadly. It's only in these NAICS codes. So that's another limitation. Uh, next slide, please. And just like veterans, the other issue is that there are ownership restrictions. So the woman has to be the 51% owner. It has to be controlled by her. She has to have the skills and expertise. And I know just like with all these programs, there is some fraud that occurs. I'm sure everyone's heard of it. And so in the situation where someone who's been there and let's say gets newly married or something and they're like, oh, well, I'm going to put my wife in charge or I have, I've seen one case, a fraud case that I had to deal with where it was the person who put their mom in charge and their mom had never really uh, worked in the industry before. That's a problem. <laughs> so you, you can't just do that. They have to actually be qualified, understand the work, and that person who's there has to be really owning and, and, and controlling it. When it comes to economic disadvantage for the EDWSB program, the net worth to get in has to be 750 or less. That excludes your house and the value of the business, and it also excludes um, retirement accounts. So Net worth, though, is different from your total assets. The total assets, six million, is the same I talked about before. So you can't you you include there the value of the business, you include there the value of your house, and you don't reduce debt. Net worth, you do reduce debt because it's net worth, but total assets is market value. So you have to make sure if you're going to go after EDWSB certification that you're meeting all of these requirements, the 750, the 350, and the, the 6 million. And then the other thing here is like the service able vet and a a programs, there are corporate structure restrictions because the woman has to directly own 51% of the company. She can't own it indirectly. So you can't have, a, a woman can't start a company, have a holding company, and then have all these other companies underneath it as subsidiaries. That does not work. That is not allowed under the program. If the subsidiaries want to be WSB certified or EDWSB, they have to be directly owned by the woman. And generally speaking, this is the same for service able vet too, you can only own one. There's some flexibility where maybe you could have two in service able vet more specifically, but you could get around it. However, there is a full-time work requirement for both SDVSB and woman owned. So it's hard to say that you can be full-time in multiple companies. Um, and because of the direct ownership, you can't set it up with holding companies and subsidiaries, which allow you more flexibility. So just, um, I, I see that as a downside because not only does it, does it stop you from organizing your company in a way that might be more efficient to do business and help with your wrap rates and stuff, but also you can't sell off these subsidiaries in order to become small again. So you need to think about, well, what work do I really need to do in my main WSB company? And is there other work you could do through a subsidiary that's wholly owned by your WSB that maybe you can push work down there that allows you some more flexibility, but that subsidiary would not be woman-owned. That subsidiary would only qualify as a small business. 
and you'd still have to aggregate and affiliate for size purposes there. So there is some flexibility you can do, but you need to think ahead of time and make sure that you're doing things appropriately. The other thing, the last thing I'll talk about is that I, we see is like anecdotally, this seems to be the least used program. And I think that has to do with the type of restrictions on NAICS codes. So you'll see it more in certain industries because those are the industries where SBA has determined women to be the most underrepresented. And so therefore the NAICS codes uh, open themselves up to more of these WSB set, set asides and, and those sorts of programs. So I think those are the main benefits and sort of drawbacks for each of these programs that we've talked about. I kind of wanted to, to go through. I know it was quick. There's a lot of information that I was trying to make sure we have in there. So if anyone has any questions, just let me know. And uh, I appreciate the time and thank you, Jennifer, again, and everyone for attending. Great presentation, Sai. Thank you so much. I actually took a couple notes and learned a couple things. So appreciate the uh, the great coverage, great information. And uh, if anybody has questions, please uh, reach out to Sai directly. Uh, his email and his phone number is on the screen there. Anyone who has registered for the webinar will receive an email within the next uh, 24 hours, and that will include the link to the recording. Uh, it also includes size uh, contact information again and a link to the PowerPoint slides because I know you had some uh, some useful links in there, which should be helpful to anyone that's um, considering any of the uh, the set aside advantages. So thanks everybody for joining us uh, this Friday. We are covering FAR Part 43, I believe is the number that we're on, and uh, and next week on Wednesday we're uh, diving a little bit uh, deeper into the Hub Zone program. So feel free to register for any of the upcoming webinars. They're all complimentary. And uh, don't miss our Hot Topics conference on Tuesday the 13th. That registration can be found on our website under the events page. Thanks again, everybody. And thanks again, Sai. It was great to have you on our program. Yeah, thank you.